the tribal area, whatever, in West Pakistan. So, how to checkmate East Pakistan? This 55% means what we had feared from before independence, that there will be a permanent Hindu majority. And we had to partition. Now again, there was going to be a permanent Bengali majority, can't be tolerated. This cannot happen. So, what happened was there was a kind of a progression towards a parity vision <laughs> that there should be two wings and they should enjoy parity of representation in the legislature. But if that is so, de-recognizing politics of identity, particularly Sindhi nationalism, Pathan nationalism, Pakun, and Baluch nationalism, and of course Bengali, that would mean that you would be getting out of politics of identity, you de-recognize provinces, nationalisms, language, and so on, and you, in a way, started running the steamer role, you steam roll the whole process of federating um, the, the, the country in terms of two equally, roughly equally, uh, operative provinces on the one hand, and putting all the areas and provinces of Pakistan, West Pakistan, together into one province. There we have. Reduced the majority of Bengalis and inflated the numbers uh, of, of West Pakistan. This was it. That is how then finally 1956 constitution was established, passed. Because now there are two wings. We were able to control the Bengali majority. But then election, election had to take place. And next year, 1956, in the West Pakistan Assembly, the resolution was passed that we want to restore provinces, all the four provinces. They hated this particular merger which was there for the separate provinces which had their histories, geographies, languages, morals and manners which were distinct. No recognition of that particular aspect of social and political existence. And therefore, when there was this challenge to one unit, some people who have been writing, for example, about civil military relations for years, they point out that Ayub Khan and Sikandar Mirza again tried <coughs> to checkmate the progress towards restoration of rights. So in a way, according to some interpreters, 1958 who also had one major objective, do not touch one unit. Now one unit destroyed federalism at the level of West Pakistan. No more representation of regions and provinces in the federation, only the mega province called West Pakistan. So here we, we have two aspects of the thinking, <coughs> one, one unit, the other intervening territory. Now if that is so, then 1970 happened, federalism was a reborn, and what do we have? Again the same problem, third time, Punjab dominates all. One province dominates all modern. Pakistanis had to deal with that particular framework, and therefore, solution this time was not parity, not one unit, Yahya Khan had already had to store, and therefore, the solution this time was two houses of the park. The Senate, the Territorial Chamber, where four territories will be represented. Punjab Population Chamber, where its majority will be taken care of. Now, this is devised in a way to constrain the majority of Punjab. At 58% at that time, 54 to 5% at this time, Punjab is still dominant. How to stop Punjab from dictating to other provinces and to the centre. One idea was set. You give equal representation to Baluchistan and 
Punjab and other provinces. And that would mean that Punjab with 54.56% and Baluchistan with 4.5% will have equal number of centers in the Senate. That means three times the representation of those minority provinces, 75% or so, 70 around, and only 23% for Punjab, three times more in the Senate. This is amazing. That was the way to constrain the Punjabi majority. And here we've got asymmetrical policy school. Yes, but no. Senate, okay. Majority belong to the smaller minority provinces. But what is this for if Senate is weak? And Senate was kept weak. Meaning thereby that there is a differential policy scope between the two houses. You debate the money bill, for example, the budget, annual budget in the National Assembly on the floor, and you pass. It may not even go to the Senate. Or even if you send it through your goodwill, the Senate doesn't have to pass. The Constitution today says, as it did 40 years back, that Senate has no authority over the money bill, meaning thereby that they conceded to Punjab. That particular financial power, even though symbolically there are two houses and the representatives of the three smaller provinces dominate in numbers. But <coughs> for all other practical purposes, it is the Punjab and it is the National Assembly and the Prime Minister is usually elected from the National Assembly where he has to have a majority support, that means leader of the House, not of Senate, but of only the National Assembly. This is but we have to take into account, for example, in Brazil and in USA, as you know, Senator in the United States is very, very powerful, and House of Representatives, the people who are called uh, the congressmen, they are not as powerful. So upper house there, but lower house in Pakistan. Now this is how Pakistan's federalism was shaped. There is a kind of a symmetrical federalism, 13 or now 23 Senators from Baluchistan, 23 from Punjab, 20 symmetrical factors. Just like in the United States, California, New York, very heavily populated. On the other hand, Hawaii has also the same number of senators. The thinly populated or thickly populated, all of them is a kind of a symmetry. But this is a mechanical approach because it is nonsense due to size, to demography, to wealth. To, to whatever. And therefore, the asymmetrical federalism is the model followed in India, where, for example, there are 13 seats for East Punjab and there are 85 seats, 80 plus seats for UP. There have been, and that would mean that uh, Mizoram, Nagaland, Punjab, others, smaller states in India, they, if they happen to have the same number of representatives in the Senate, that would mean that there will be 100 or so on one side and there will be only um, 10, 20 others uh, or, or 40, for example, from Maharashtra and from uh, UP and from Bihar and whatever. So it would not have worked. So what did they do? UP has more representation in the Senate and of course the Himachal uh, Pradesh or Punjab or Haryana have a, 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 an inconsequential representation and thereby the Rajya Sabha is therefore a bit sensitive to the demographic pattern of the states and that provided for provinces. Here we've got ethnic federalism. Now what distinguishes us from the United States, from Canada? from Germany, Canada leaving uh, French speaking countries aside, otherwise it is, these, these are the countries which are the leading federations, but they are not based, these particular federating units are not based on ethnicity. California speaks English and New York speaks English, and of course other states speak English, 
and did not have ethnically distinct uh, origins. And similarly, Germany and Australia, they are all English speaking and they are mostly English men and uh, women uh, throughout history and whatever. But with us, historical, ethnic, and linguistic social identity. That makes Pakistan, just like India, an ethnic federation. This is what it is different. But it's not only that. It's not that two or three or four uh, ethnic uh, communities operate side by side. No. There's a kind of uh, ethnic hierarchy. That is why Bengalis and Sindhis and uh, Baloch and Pakhtuns, they have always been talking about a Muhajir Punjabi state, which is Pakistan. This Muhajir Punjabi state, particularly in the beginning, uh, because afterwards it's now Punjabi Muhajir state, Punjab has come up to a, a process of Punjabization during the last three or four hundred years, uh, the two and a half uh, decades. So what is it? This was the ethnic hierarchy. Three percent of the Urdu-speaking population of Pakistan in 1968 had a representation, for example, in Pakistan Foreign Service at, the, at, at 56 percent. Three percent, 56 percent. And overall, on an average, this 3 percent of the speaking population of Pakistan had um, 21 percent jobs. One fifth, they completely dominate, particularly at the upper echelons, the, 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 the jobs. Um, and of course, Muhajir was um, over represented in, 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 the, uh, in, in literature, in, in, uh, in bourgeoisie, that is the uh, industrial business class, and of course, in the bureaucracy all the top bureaucrats, and of course in so many other ways, Islamic teaching, ulema, all two or three major uh, ulema, the heads of uh, religious parties came from India, and so on. So, Tashubir Ahmad Usmani on top of uh, Jui, and of course Mawlana Dudi on top of Maslami, and of course Nurani and others. So, what do we have here? We've got a complete domination of the migrants, not of the good speaking in one sense, but East Punjabis also, only one institution which is very dominant here in the land of their migration that was art. That is how the two um, the powerful Indians were operating and driving the country for years, and that ethnic hierarchy has still not been broken, and therefore there is a tussle all the time between the boundaries of one community and institutional boundaries given to us by the outgoing colonial state. So Punjab has, rightly speaking, in same after partition, there's the sizable number of Bhagavad Muhajis, and of course, historically speaking, the Bhatans have all lumped together in Baluchistan and Hazara, which means Hindu speaking people, in KP, again, are a, 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 a relatively ill absorbed. Uh, community. While for 23 years of war, this was the situation, 1973 constitution tried to solve the issue of Punjabi domination on the one hand through bicameralism, on the other hand, it gave birth to new issues. Four provinces were identified in the name of the majority communities of these four provinces. Punjabis have a problem. Sindhis, Baluj, and Pakhtun. Identity, the ethnic identity became first time in reality accommodated within the constitution. It federalized the imagination of those who were uh, operating uh, all around and that is where within that particular structure the division of powers was um, in a way taking place and we've got a pattern here, 1935, 1956, and there were three lists, 1962 only the federal list, the residuary powers will go only to the provinces. 1973 constitution, though that is two, that's it. No provincial list. Provinces were extremely unhappy about it, but there was a concrete list and the federal list. And what was the whole struggle about? Concrete list must go, because that also means the federal 
less because two axes were not there was a combination there whenever there was a time of a conflict between the two lists or those who controlled powers under those lists therefore not to 2010 uh, amendment whereby 47 subjects out of that 40 were taken away from the content list uh, and given to the provinces not as listed <coughs> as uh, in a formal sense but mainly because they became residuary powers which landed to the provinces that's how provinces became rather uh, autonomous independent powerful and this is how there is a kind of a comparison between India and Pakistan. In India, provinces were reorganized on the basis of language. Language is fine. Don't bring in religion. They had had enough. All the time they were talking about religion that had proved to be uh, a, a factor in disintegration of India. Look, they got Pakistan out of India. We do not want any more Pakistans. Uh, that means take religion out of politics. This was a model which operated there, but then people's identities were very much uh, operationalized on the basis of language, language yes. And therefore, you see, province after province in India from 50, in, in, in the 50s and later in Punjab in 1966, that there was provincial reorganization. Eastern Punjab, which was one third of Punjab uh, under the British, that one third was then subdivided into three provinces. East Punjab, Haryana, and Hamachal Pradesh, whereas we have continued to be the way we were born. So this is one, and that means in Pakistan, it's just the reverse. Religion in, language out. Do not talk of language. All the Brahm Sahibs, all the educated elite of Pakistan, the, all the all particularly of Punjab, but also from elsewhere, they disbelieve in the idea of creating provinces on the basis of language. Language, that means it's disintegration. The country will be uh, um, just divided into so many units and therefore don't talk of language. If you remember, the moment there was this 18th Amendment passed and there was this new name for AP, uh, for, for under UFP, Pakhtun uh, for Nawaz uh, retaliated and um, sought some kind of an amendment and that's how came into being. So, no provincial organization has taken place in 67 years in Pakistan to accommodate the linguistic diversity and, of course, uh, loyalties and identities based on that particular uh, aspect. So, sometimes, of course, the, the, the army and the bureaucracy, they have agreed to multiplication of provinces. Yes, every division should be a province, which means what? Uh, 11 regions, for example, in one province and three or four and whatever. So there will be a kind of a 20 province, Pakistan, which is an administrative territorial approach to provinces. This is an attempt to de-recognize identity. We do not recognize identity. That is from 1948 onwards when we de-recognize the demand of Bengali uh, the linguistic uh, the activists. There, there has been a persistent pattern of de-recognizing language as a legitimate entity. And that's how there have been quite a few constraints put in the uh, legal framework that we've got, where if you want to create a new province, then there should be the two-thirds majority of that particular uh, assembly of the province, which is going to be divided. And therefore, after the division, again, there will be a kind of a two-thirds majority and there uh, in India, the idea is states are destructible. Union is indestructible. Which means that India, the way it is, as a territorial entity, you can touch, but the states shrinking, expanding, whatever, that's all right. And Lok Sabha then tries to do whatever they can. Uh, unfortunately, in Pakistan, that is not the provision. Now, from where suddenly we've got 18th Amendment and the idea to change federalism, here we've got the Charter of Democracy, which took place, uh, which was signed by the two major parties and others, 2006. And here we've got Parliament sovereignty. There wasn't any, because President could dismiss the Parliament under the Article of 58 to B. Now that would go, it should go. And 
content list should go. And minorities, there was no representation of minorities in the Senate. And now there is, as per the 2010 8th Amendment. And of course, Musharraf had tried to control the, the times that Vashi of Benazi would be, would become prime ministers. And first time ever, instead of the president appointing judges, this time now, uh, it's the Judicial Commission which will do it. That issue emerged after the Al Jihad Trust case in 1996. Uh, and there had been a kind of a tussle between the executive and the judiciary who has the final power to appoint judges. Because the idea was that the executive is very corrupt and it only appoints judges who are pro PBMLF or pro PPP or in favor of some other uh, 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 government. And therefore, judges distrusted the, the, the prime ministers in succession. On the other hand, prime ministers and others, the parliament felt that how could a chief justice just decide that he wants this, 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 and this uh, judge into the high courts and uh, the Supreme Court included. And therefore, the tussle continued, and the idea was that there should be a kind of a judicial commission not a person that is prime president or prime minister, but a judicial commission where there will be judges represented, parliamentary committee represented, and of course lawyers and the bar council. Of course, they had, they had asked for integration of FATA with AP. That was not accepted under the 18th Amendment and ISI, MI, to be accountable, nobody touched it. They were given a clear idea, do not turn this way. And of course, there was this establishment of a constitutional court that did not happen. So what do we have here? Towards the precipice, that means the fiscal federalism already had taken place. That means 2009, which held 2010-18 amendment. So 2009 NFC award is considered to be a revolutionary step forward. Then people think that that paved the way actually. Uh, for further uh, demolition, because here, from uh, the center, which was all dominant, it surrendered to the provinces part of the divisible pool, and within or among the provinces, Punjab agreed to bring down its share, and Baluchistan's share was double, that means 4.5, that means 9. And therefore, there was quite a bit of furor after this particular success was achieved and uh, uh, also for, on a permanent basis the smaller provinces lobbied heavily that um, it shouldn't be only the population. Punjab in terms of uh, population is very, very dominant therefore the, 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 the share of Punjab should be uh, recognized, justified uh, on that basis. Other criteria should be brought in. For example, that Baluchistan has the 20 poorest districts of Pakistan. So, this should be taken into consideration when you allocate resources to various provinces and, of course, revenue generation, because in Karachi, particularly the MP and Balas, the, the Mohali nationalists, talk about um, the fact or the fiction, whatever, that they, that is, the Karachi Balas provide to the nation 7% of the revenue, which is obviously exaggerated. But still, um, the, the, the others, uh, the economists, bring it down the number to 35%, uh, um, uh, whereas uh, the province gets only 23%, and there was a kind of a lag, and they wanted to fail, and that's why they again and again brought in the aspect of revenue generation, while Brostan insisted on poverty, and of course, there was the inverse uh, population density again in Baluchistan. So if this is so, what did 18th Amendment do? Here we've got a certain list of achievements that provinces should be brought into consideration. Provincial uh, share, for example, the, the uh, 2009 uh, NFC award has taken place. Next one, uh, if it decides to bring down the provincial uh, contribution uh, uh, allocation, unfortunately, that will mean that it comes and goes that way. There is a topsy-turvy package 
So we try to secure the last time whatever we got, we were able to get and secure and confirm. It should never be reversed. That was a major achievement in that way. And of course, there is the uh, report we presented and uh, membership of the NFC should be uh, expanded to and whatever. So we've got here a list of uh, so-called achievements of the policies that in so many ways they tried to uh, define their role uh, and there was a kind of uh, self-projection. They were able to bring in some of the powers of the Federation to the provinces and particularly this one that um, the, the mineral wealth should be owned practically jointly uh, uh, till then sui gas and others there had been uh, issues relating to the distribution of the uh, funds. So there are various kinds of achievements here and lost the first was it a who? The centralist forces army and bureaucracy. Okay. They felt and they in fact berated, the, uh, you know, they ridiculed Punjabi uh, politicians who came out of the meetings and they were those who had uh, confirmed and they put their uh, signature on, uh, on the paper. They said, you have destroyed yourself, you have destroyed Pakistan. Where have you led this country to? Uh, so what's the coup? Both uh, state institutions hated it because the idea is one of shared sovereignty, provinces and the center. There is a sub-sovereign unit, the federating unit. Now who pushed it? First, ethnic party, they won. And second, the minority provinces. Ethno-nationalist groups mainly came from minority provinces. Punjab, there you hardly have any Punjabi nationalist movement so thereby, the minority provinces on the one hand and the ethnic parties on the other, they were able to push for this particular uh, uh, amendment. But for army and the bureaucracy, it was a kind of a step back because that was where they felt that the control over various subjects which had now been transferred to Goita and Karachi and uh, Peshawar, the centralist bureaucracy in Islamabad would definitely lose control over those subjects and ideologically, genuinely, there was a kind of a feeling that this is one, this is the first step towards disintegration of the country. Because they cannot take any other model other than, for example, a devolved power structure. So whomsoever I talked to, for example, in this process, they were very apprehensive about the, uh, the whole uh, development. Why? because there is a major difference between civilian and military perspectives. One, the whole idea is people should be participatory. They should be more and more participating in the business of the government. On the other hand, if you remember Nalyu Khan and of course others, stability, stability, they constantly talk about keeping the country together and for that, come what may, the idea is not participation, the idea is stability and that is why the softer route to coming together is through consensus and the 18th amendment projected that particular aspect of the, uh, constitutional development which is consensus. On the other hand, the two institutions, particularly the army, talks about the uh, same kind of uh, meeting of minds in another way which is unity unity and unity, uh, as opposed to Indian model where there is unity and diversity, uh, unfortunately. Uh, in Pakistan, that's not the uh, prime value. And coordination, command, command structure. That is how the, the, the young cadets, uh, when they went to America and they found American presidential system to be working there, from that time onwards, for the last 60 years, most often the, the army leadership talks about the presidential system where there should be a command structure, all the power should be exercised by one person through his nominees, not to public representatives like there is uh, the case in a parliamentary system where those MNAs who have already been elected by the people, they would be the ministers, not directly your nominees. And of course, 
we are constantly talking about democracy on the one hand, but the, the, the central point of discussion uh, uh, among the generals, for example, is that it is the security. Security comes first. What democracy if there is no Pakistan? So this is the kind of rather primitive logic, unfortunately, which is used um, uh, to, to, in a way, undermine the participatory nature of a democratic system. Therefore, no to devolution. And politicians, yes to devolution, particularly those from the smaller provinces. It was a major achievement to bring Punjab along with this particular thinking. Punjab, which will never listen to these uh, kinds of demands, uh, devolutionary demands, and that is how 18th Amendment has not succeeded fully in terms of implementation. There are bottlenecks, for example, there is a weak federal government. It could not push through under the PPP and army and judiciary made it a point that all the, the subjects are not transferred. There are quite a few divisions of those ministries which continue to be located in Islamabad and so on. And there has been a plea that provinces do not have the power, the authority, the capability of absorbing all this, particularly the administration, but also the finance which had been transferred to them. And army securitization vision does not allow any weakening. For example, Gawadar, what is this Baloch nationalist voice? It doesn't sink. It, it, it looks strange. Alien. We are talking about the country going up, projects, big projects, mega projects, and there are the local, very local, the minuscule groups which are not allowing and so on. And of course the bureaucracy doesn't like it. Bureaucracy has been uh, ruling the country for the last 70 years, 57 years, and how can they um, let power go uh, and go to those provincial capitals, particularly the two? Shower and Quetta, which are not attractive enough, and of course, uh, financial centralization, which is that there is revenue raising power 90% with the center. Provinces raise revenue 8 to 9%. There is a total dependence on the center. There is 32% <coughs> of the expenditure for the provinces, from where would they get? They would get from the center. So there is a regime which is called resource transfer regime. It is always uh, down to a begging bowl. Provinces ask for whatever. Whereas uh, compare the federal system in, in, in the United States, where 60% lies with the center, 21% with the states, and 19%, a whopping 19%, which means less than 1% in Pakistan, the local bodies, 19% in the United States, there is absolutely no, uh, there is absolutely no comparison between the two, and uh, there is an idea that local bodies are simply uh, irrelevant, and that's why the revenue raising power is simply not recognized. So here is the problem. 18th Amendment led straight away to alienation of smaller province, uh, communities. That means Mahajir in Sindh, Saraiki in Punjab, Hinko speaking in KP, and Patun in Baluchistan. So now there was a demand for new provinces on the basis of language. So language which was denied a role is now creeping in slowly and gradually, uh, the Indian sort of model. And here we've got the new demands, and suddenly the language issue was exploited by unlikely pro protagonists. And they've started saying, there should be Hazara, not directly related to that particular region, but they were constantly at it. And PMLM retaliated to the PPP's demand for a southern Punjab province, and they started saying, okay, Karachi should be a separate province, 
So, Shabbat Sharif came out. And similarly, you are talking about other provinces where you do not have a representation of your own. And that is how the whole issue was in a way confused and it was less than serious. And um, after the first flurry of demands for new provinces, there had been a kind of a forgetting about whatever uh, <coughs> could happen or could take place by way of new provinces. So sometimes they said, okay, there should be three provinces out of Sindh, four provinces out of Baluchistan, and whatever. The old territorial administrative approach, which was very popular uh, with the ruling elite, particularly the RD and the bureaucracy, who do not want to identify language or ethnicity as the legitimate base for political demands and identity, therefore, this that, that, that particular um, you know, upsurge in a way uh, in favor of new provinces that, was, that subsided in the last one year, that is 2014. So now the, the, the whole issue of creation of new provinces is somewhat uh, redundant, not very much uh, part and parcel of the critical debate and therefore one thing which again was missed by the 2010 amendment was nothing about local bodies. What is it? In general, the world over, they define local bodies as the nursery for training politicians. It is the nursery for democratization of the vision and so on. But in Pakistan, as we all know, is the army which has constantly been hooked on the idea of <coughs> empowering local bodies. Whenever there is a there is an elected government in power, they try to forget about it, just bury it. The, the, the answer is simple. That is, the center from 1947 onwards was always in the hands of the military bureaucratic establishment. And the district has been controlled by the bureaucracy. It is only the province for 100 years in British India and after that in Pakistan and after that again post-partition India, politicians have their power base in the provinces everywhere in this part of the world. And it is from the province that they move to the center. Mm. And this is exactly what has been happening here because political parties operate out there with their legs into the constituencies <coughs> where they stand upon and they have their roots in the villages, in the towns, in the districts and whatever. If you cut the legs of political parties, just destroy their foothold and reroute the funding process through the local bureaucracy or through the MNAs on top, then obviously the party workers on one side in the constituency who have not been elected, they have been just nominated by party leaders. On the other hand, local bodies, uh, members, district councillors, union councillors, they have been elected by the people, therefore they enjoy a higher level of legitimacy. This has been the uh, political approach of the military. How to cut down the role of politicians, create a sense of their disempowerment among the people and make them in a way believe that the way out lies with the bureaucracy and on top with the army. So whenever there is a coup that is followed by the empowerment of the local bodies. Why? It takes away the endemic power of political parties because that's how they are rendered weak. That explains why the moment these parties came to power in 19 and 2013. What happened? 
in local body elections, which are going to be held very soon, postponed. In Set, postponed. In Punjab, postponed. And in KP, only Baluchistan, where the general idea is there is a powerless uh, 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 province anyway, and they totally depend on the allocation of resources from the center. Uh, there, of course, uh, they moved ahead, particularly because there is no dominant political force, and the tribal leaders uh, somehow found it reasonable to appoint uh, to, to project their uh, nominees, who then won elections in their localities. So, what what do we have here? Devolution. Is it a genuine ideal for for the military bureaucratic establishment? No. Uh, what had happened in 2008, 2010-18th uh, Amendment, that these political forces who operate at the provincial level, where they operate anyway, there the smaller parties and smaller communities were able to secure a deal for themselves. That did not mean that the implementation will be successful. And straight after that, there was a kind of a disapproval. There are two things which uh, must be mentioned here. First, why is the MPM constantly talking about the local government? Because short of creation of a new province, which is Mohadu province, which will probably sometime take shape, maybe in 10 years, 20 years, or whatever, or never, as if, if the nationalists continue to be vigilant. So, that is why because there will never be a majority in a government in Karachi as far as there is a united province of sin. That is why they talk about a kind of a local government where Karachi at least will be secured for them because whenever there is local government, the mayor of Karachi runs administration and his finance is uh, more than the finance of whole of Dostan and whatever. His richest city of Pakistan. So that explains why there is only one political party which is anxious to hold local body elections. Others are the damn bother about that particular level of administration which is at the district because they want to secure themselves and their place at the set. So now where are we? Are we in New federalism. The centralist establishment, which is army, has no space for devolution in its uh, map. That map doesn't allow this particular uh, way of exercise of power. And as you have all seen, four times the Constitution was unable to. <coughs> stop a military coup. In Pakistan, there is a kind of a seesaw going on. Constitution is simply too strong, embedded in the tradition of 100 and now 50 to 60 years. Constitution is too strong. Despite the best wishes of Jawlak, who said that it's only a piece of paper like a dirt and throw it into the wind, and other, others who took over power, whatever. We have been part and parcel of the constitutional development of India for 100 years, and after that again, <coughs> the lawyers and the judges and, and, and the politicians and, and, and even the army, which is totally run by a legal framework within the organization and the bureaucracy. Therefore, there is no doing away with law. And that is why every coup maker, four of them, had to hold elections because they just found themselves illegitimate rulers. Legitimacy gap we tend to undermine or we tend to underemphasize. But four of them, all four of them, had to hold elections because constitutional tradition is simply too strong. On the other hand, constitutional tradition is not so strong that it debars any Bonapartist general from uh, going ahead with an adventure. This is the uh, unfortunate 
aspect of the political system in Pakistan, and federalism is very much part of it. Uh, federalism, that means devolution, to those whom the establishment thinks that there are sharks out there in the provinces and they must be stopped from taking over power, particularly because there are two aspects of it which have been controlled by the, the center. One, revenue raising authority has not been transferred to the provinces, not much, because there is one aspect only, the service based uh, transfer a little, but overall from 92 to 90, down to 90 percent or 89 percent or whatever, the finance is controlled by the center. What can you, how far can you go in terms of decentralized? The uh, one who controls purse controls policy. It's as simple as that. Second, when devolution was put in place, if you remember, in 2001, uh, there was quite a bit of a talk about administrative decentralization. Bureaucratic reforms, today it is the center which holds examination for CSS, mm. it recruits, it trains, it promotes, it transfers the bureaucrats and politicians in the provinces feel very much constrained in terms of exercise of power because they can't. These are the bureaucrats, chief secretaries, secretaries, others who are establishment's nominees. They are the ones, uh, they, they, they carry a centralist uh, dynamics to the provinces. Therefore, because of these two aspects, that is the financial centralization and administrative centralization, probably the limits of uh, the distance with the 18th Amendment uh, would allow for the politicians remains limited. And here we've got the political initiative, particularly in 2014 in Pakistan and 2015, the first two months, where one of the other the political leadership has conceded the initiative to the army uh, in terms, of, for example, of military operation against the terrorists and, of course, conducted diplomacy uh, in, in Washington and in Beijing and in uh, Kabul and, of course, elsewhere. Therefore, it seems that the uh, foreign office uh, has been reduced to a post office where uh, they only have to uh, get the orders from somewhere and um, forward the orders uh, um, to some other uh, actors and state functionaries. So what do we have here? That there is a constitutional formula, it has been put into place, but the civil military relations context in Pakistan is such that you cannot go very far in terms of um, fulfilling the, the, the provisions which were there in terms of hard core reality. Uh, if you remember, the uh, Constitution has Article 6, and how far have we gone in this direction? We have been proved uh, right in our cynicism that that is one area where probably progression or progress towards some uh, conclusive sort of uh, development in terms of civil relations will not take place and will not happen. Thank you very much. Dr. Haseem for such an enlightening, wonderful talk on federalism and civil military relation in Pakistan. Now the house is open for a discussion, so we will take the question one by one. So first, I think, uh, I appreciate the enlightened talk that I heard, very really rare. And it opened up new vistas of thought for analyzing the 18th Amendment in a new perspective. My question is uh, to uh, seek some clarity on the concept when we believe that within a democratic system is the local governments are the nurseries for nurturing politicians for a future role at a higher level. <coughs> then why does the military regimes encourage them 
And how is it that they overpower through them to rule over people in an undemocratic manner? I, I, I'm, I'm seeking clarity on this point, which I could not achieve after. Uh, when I talk, for example, to donors or the diplomats or the foreign scholars, uh, they find it strange that politicians in Pakistan are not sensitive to local government. This is amazing. They don't want it. The Democrats don't want democracy at the grassroots level. The way you put the question carries some kind of an answer within that question. So, the first thing is that we have to go out of the box and redefine the context within which local government institutions operate. So, local governments were appendages from 1883 onwards to the system at the higher levels which was controlled by the bureaucrats. So it was a kind of a collaborative mechanism where the local elite, the landlords uh, throughout Punjab and Sindh and various other areas, they were in a way in contact with the DC, Deputy Commissioner, and in the collector. Uh, there was a kind of a, um, an alliance or collaboration between the DC, the, 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 the bureaucracy, the British bureaucracy, and the local representatives. That aspect was no more. By 1919, James Court reforms. By 1935, India Act. Because then local representatives moved on and they fought elections for representation in the legislative councils and assemblies. That particular role which was kept for them initially in the days of Lord uh, Ripon and others, 1880s, 90s, that was in a way overruled, superseded, superseded by the new aspect where legislative powers of the legislative assemblies expanded. Now those local landlords were interested in grabbing power at the higher level, as the British bureaucracy, the white bureaucracy got weakened and they were less and less so in command. Therefore, that is one aspect that straight after independence, what we got is, number one, the ambition of the political elite to be represented at the provincial and central levels, federal level. They were less and less interested in local government. Second, the government at the district level continued to be in the hands of the bureaucrats as it was for 100 years. Another 50 years, even today in the year 2014 and now 15, who is the most powerful person in the district? It is the deputy commissioner. With a, or rather after a, a, a an interregnum of a few years under Musharraf, when Musharraf appointed Nazims and DC was devoted to DCO, apart from that, most of the time in the modern history of India and Pakistan, it is the administrative authority in the district which is the pivot of rule in Pakistan. That is how the moment that you come to over, 1958, 1959, he gave us basic democracy system. Even before the 1962 constitution, which came three years later, and with there, this local body system was um, incorporated. So what is that? There is the military thinking about how to bring in the masses into the system, not directly. The the the, the Kada system or, 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 or the or should I say the class system or should I move on and define the two um, the two tier uh, structure of the army, the gazetted, the the the, the, the with a or rather after a, a, a an interregnum of a few years under Musharraf when Musharraf appointed Nazims and 
this you are devoted to this you. Apart from that, most of the time in the modern history of India and Pakistan, it is the administrative authority in the district which is the pivotal rule in Pakistan. That is how the moment that you come to over, 1958, 1959, he gave us basic democracy system. Even before the 1962 constitution, which came three years later, and with there, this local body system was um, incorporated. So what is that? There is immediately thinking about how to bring in the masses into the system, not directly. The, 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 the other system, or, 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 the, or should I say, the class system, or should I move on and define the two, um, the two tier uh, structure of the army, the gazetted, the, 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 uh, the, the officer, the officer cadre, and Mr. Khan, and the last time, and others, to the large there is a clear division here. The masses are represented in the military mind through the non-officer cadre people. They are the masses. And they can only be patronized. So for 100 years, the rule system was called, defined, understood as paternalistic rule. This word, for example, I've used in my book, again again, the paternalistic rule, Maiba, the Andres Maiba, that was the term used for them. So that is what the military goes back to again and again. The, the historical uh, West had a different experience. So let's try to understand the role of the uh, local bank here in Pakistan in the way uh, I'm trying to discuss. For example, in England you have a Hiva county as a conservative county. This county is ruled by the Liberals, others in Pakistan is anathema, non-party based election. No, if you have old party based election, what will happen? The nation will be divided. This is totally uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of a, an unimaginative approach to the, to the whole idea. Because why not? If they can fight election on the first provincial and the national assembly uh, on the basis of party, why not? Uh, at that level. So there are things where the military or the establishment's interests, they collide with the interests of others, and that is why political elite wants devolution from the center to the provinces, which has only 8% of revenue raising authority, and when there is a talk of devolution further down to the district, politicians become extremely conservative and doesn't want to part with the power which, the little power which. Uh, he has or she has, uh, and that is what makes him or her nervous. Uh, please introduce briefly yourself before you ask the question, but more Dr. Dr. Niyaz Murtaza. Uh, my name is Dr. Niyaz Murtaza. I am a senior fellow at UC Berkeley. Uh, very good uh, talk, uh, Dr. Vaseem. As I was mentioning to you, I have read all of your articles and books, but despite that, I found a lot of new things today. So if you could just talk about two or three things, maybe, you know, one is Council of Common Interest and how that fits in with, you know, with the fact that we already have a Senate which takes care of, you know, these uh, provincial parities uh, and whether, you know, countries like India have something similar or not. The second thing is this idea of, you know, the Federation appointing governors. Again, I don't know whether Indian states have even governors or not and how they get appointed if they do have it. And the third thing is about uh, Gilgit Baltistan because it just seems to be, you know, in a vacuum with no clear status. Thank you. So all the key aspects. Uh, first of all, 
The TCI compliance of his described as a semi-executive body because there are chief ministers uh, uh, and their uh, uh, colleagues representing and the other governments. So it's not simply a kind of a, a body where politicians, political parties, or MLAs or MPAs are represented. <coughs> meaning what? Meaning the why that they can deliver. They will go back to the provinces and those um, uh, uh, at least points uh, then have to be you know, implemented. So that was the original idea. Federation from 1973 onwards has been expanded. And every now and then there is some kind of a move forward, I would say. Constitutional development is in a positive light. Let's say 70-80 percent. There are posts. Uh, step back. Um, but in terms of federation, the idea has been that progress should be progress. One major reason was that there was a popular leader who controlled the army uh, for six years. In from 1947 to 2015, today, in my study, for example, I've, I've divided Soviet relations in four or five different phases. Uh, the only time when there was civilian supremacy over armed forces was Bhutto's rule. Six years, 71 to 77. 30, yeah, six years. It's amazing. There has been democracy, of course. There has been a parliamentary democracy and the presidential of government, uh, majority of the years in Pakistan's history, but civil military relations have been such that these have, in a way, uh, these have cast their shadow on the way power will be distributed, meaning the evil law And that is how uh, CCI, in a way, came to being and by Cameronism came to be as a direct result of Bangladesh. Bangladesh separated, the army leadership could never imagine. The tradition could never imagine. And they came up with the idea of Sindhi Stavan, Sindhu Desh, 1972-73, when the constitution was uh, emerging. Therefore, the post-Bangladesh ruling elite, both civil and military, were very sensitive to the ethnic demands. And they tried to go an extra mile to accommodate Sindhu Desh or provincial autonomy oriented demands. And some forums were established. One of them is, of course, CCI, as I mentioned, because <coughs> made into a kind of an executive body, but what is the result in the last 40 years? Nothing shiny to show. Uh, because uh, <coughs> the, 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 there is a, a give and take at some stage, but I don't think that the four governments in the provinces, the one government at the center, lacks the part with whatever authority it has. Uh, in India, there was quite a bit of a controversy last year. Uh, last year? Uh, no, there, yeah, last year, there is half the elections. Modi changed one to two governors. The one resigned, the other, uh, there, there was a kind of a controversy about it. Meaning thereby <coughs> that there started an, a debate. Should the Federation appoint governors? Because that is we know that is the constitutional provision. The idea is that governor is not the ruler, is the chief minister of the ruler in a state, in the province of Pakistan, and therefore there is the representation of the federation in Karnataka, in Kashmir, elsewhere, in UP. How is the union represented there? That is why uh, the contact person between the provincial government and the central government is supposed to be the governor. 
he is or she is the nominee of the Prime Minister or the Senator. This is the practice lesson, as I understand. And in that context, in Pakistan, there has been a general um, attitude to keep governors as nominees of the center. Uh, it is not exactly the way it is. For example, Ishabdullah Gibad is the nominee of which center? The military center or the political party center, BMLN or PPP or Musharraf. And the Buddha, for example, had uh, taken a way out of the linguistic right rights in 1932, <coughs> and he appointed Rana Yakadili as governor. There was a kind of an ethnic issue which he sought to resolve through the appointment of a Lutu speaking governor, uh, whereas she was not for the party and she did not have any kind of an institutional link in any other way. So what do we have here? Not, <coughs> not a party member. This is not necessarily a, a route taken by the party members. Although right now it is the name, names of party members in AMLN which are being considered for governorship in Punjab. So there is a mix back here. Uh, for various reasons, uh, the center has been appointing governors or letting governors, existing governors continue, like in the case of Sindh. Now, Gilgit Pakistan. Gilgit Pakistan is not a province. There are four provinces only in Pakistan. Gilgit is also not a part of Azad Kashmir because it is uh, separated, separated from Azad Kashmir in 1936. It was uh, given on lease to uh, the British government in India, which uh, wanted to operate there as a security mechanism vis-à-vis uh, -vis China and, and they won't uh, carry them there, for example, from South Korea at that time. So they tried to secure this area uh, against the external challenges, mainly. But what happened over the years was that it was, you know, we cut off administratively speaking. Um, so they want, that is the dignity nationalists whom I talk to, they want, unlike Baruch nationalists, unlike other nationalists, ethnic nationalists, who want a kind of autonomous or independent life. The Gilgit nationalist wants integration with Pakistan. And he or she feels that they are stateless. They are not represented in the Constitutional Assembly, that is the National Assembly of Pakistan. What kind of distance there is? They don't have uh, the, the cards that way, they don't have a uh, vote. So who are they? Are they Pakistanis or are they not Pakistanis? This is a question we get raised all the time. Uh, because Kashmir, that is the last question, does have a constitution and a Supreme Court and a, uh, an assembly where there is a chief minister. That is how, after several reforms in Bagan, Pakistan, 1970s, 19, uh, and later on in the 1990s, 2009, Zadari then finally uh, expanded the power base of the local representatives and uh, somehow uh, the domination of Islamabad over Gilgit continues. Just like in the case of Azad Kashmir. <laughs> Azad Kashmir and the Gilgitis, they are now, uh, there is drawn uh, against each other because Kashmir wants Gilgit back. Gilgit doesn't want to go back. They want to be part and parcel of the mainstream politics in Pakistan. So there is this kind of an spillover, let's say, uh, in the demand structure on the two sides. My name is Kamran Asim. I am assistant professor at Golden College of Sir, so my question is that uh, according to the 18th Amendment, it, uh, 17 uh, federal ministries have been devolved to the provinces. And at the same time, center has created a uh, few uh, ministries with new names. Uh, that, that is very unfortunate. 
and the architect of the eighth amendment rizal khani also criticized at that time so uh, there is a uh, one thinking that uh, 18th amendment was passed in a hurry and uh, provinces were not ready to absorb the um, powers which had been transferred to them and uh, the other thinking is that uh, there is a mindset uh, which does not want to devolve power at the provincial level or provinces from to uh, from provinces to the uh, district level and uh, not holding of district Uh, uh, a local government election is the example of that. So, what are your comments on this? I mean, I uh, partially agree with government. Um, the fact that this, uh, uh, this the Scottish government in general or the Russian to the provinces beyond a certain extent, there is the politicians then who do not want further division of the district level. There are two different stakeholders um, in terms of status quo and change. Uh, You know, as far as uh, passing the amendment in Hari is concerned, I think uh, we were very frustrated at that time because it took more than uh, two years. We were constantly that the public, the 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 and we continue to be in the hands of us in the party. Uh, if we want it, then we will resolve. And we were given all the time this, um, uh, let's say, uh, idea that um, all the retentions are added and then they, they do something. So probably there wasn't a hurry uh, um, in terms of passing the uh, amendment, but probably In terms of uh, going ahead with it without bureaucratic uh, reforms, where <coughs> provincial civil service should have been strengthened, is the relationship between the week, PCS, the West Corps, provincial civil service, and there should have been other ways of uh, improvement in the power structure at the center. What happened, and it really happened, whenever in the world. In the last century, for example, in the 19th and 20th century, in the West, uh, the idea is that you transfer revenue, revenue raising authority to the uh, lower levels. It increases corruption, or uh, certainly efficiency. Those who, for example, were against devolution of uh, or rather decentralisation of uh, ATC, they argued against it exactly because they felt that in the provincial provinces. Uh, there will be far less of efficiency. They will not be taking into account the, uh, the idea of quality, and there will be far more patronage in the provinces. And the provinces are not ready for that kind of devolution. Uh, also, financially, for example, there was quite a bit of a large sum transferred to Rajasthan under the previous government of Nawaz Sharif, and it led to reckless purchase of. Um, uh, jeeps and cars and whatever uh, for those who were the public office holders, and thereby uh, leading to irresponsible expenditure. So there are these dangers, which are then highlighted by the pro-status quo forces, particularly army and the bureaucracy. Uh, on the other hand, the 18th Amendment is now a cottage industry. I have been writing, others have been writing, Dr. Lee, you know, some of this here, he will probably, he must have said something about it. There is a book coming out, I, I organized a conference in Lungs, where there were, I think, eight or nine or ten people, uh, and she had a foundation who, who sponsored it, financed it, and they, 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 they are serious about it. People are now into it. Somehow the idea is accepted as legitimate, uh, but the power structure hasn't changed, and is not likely to change because of the two things I mentioned: one, control of parts; the other, control over the so-called steel frame of the state, which is the bureaucracy.
So my name is Orosia Rustar. My question is, for example, in our history there is the example of this uh, one unit and then subsequently there is no military courts operating. So, for example, would, uh, my first question is related that you have called this ethnic federalism. But I think it would be more suitable if you call it military federalism. And you second, yeah. military federalism. Yes. And secondly, sir, how would they come? Military federalism means? For example, I would call this, you have called it um, um, ethnic federalism. I would call, uh, it would be suitable if we call it military federalism. Because if we want to distinct, distinguish it from other federalism, then we must say that it is a military federalism. And secondly, sir, my question is related about this military force. For example, how it, in other democracy we don't see such a capacities, but here in Pakistan, in the, this democracy, the, it has such a capacity that it is absorbing military force. So, uh, this thing. And secondly, sir, thirdly, that what is happening in Father and Balochistan, how you see that it is linked with this federalism issue? The problems of Father and Balochistan. Yes, sir. So one, I would say, the first thing, I don't know how to call it on military federalism. I don't know. Uh, what is it? The federalism has been exercised both under civil and military rule. Under Muslim, for example, there were four provinces. So, um, Catherine Agnew, for example, has written uh, about the issue whether there can be federation under the military rule. Uh, or is it only the civilian rule? And she obviously has picked up on Pakistan and said that yes, uh, there can be federation without democracy, but there cannot be uh, any dispensing with, with, with democracy as such, uh, meaning thereby that military federalism is some kind of a term which I can't handle what we mean by that. Actually, that's why I asked the question. Uh, if you mean that there is uh, that there are uh, four military units or whatever, or four provinces dominated each of them by the military, and then they should have some kind of a uh, collaboration. I don't know, but practically speaking, under the generals, the federation which was there, it operated as what you call military federalism, maybe meaning that these were the governors who were left in generals, the, the coup maker appointed them, and they were the, the governors, there were no key minister, no parliament, no, no assemblies in those provinces. And so it was straight, a centralist rule uh, in name and in form pattern, but uh, administratively pattern, but otherwise uh, drawing authority from the same source, which was the chief of army staff and the army in general. Uh, you talk about the the way Fata uh, is ruled, or what could be done with Fata. Uh, as we all know, Fata is part of the federation in the sense that Elgin is not, and in the sense that Azad Shmi is not, because it was not a disputed area vis-a-vis India. So he could constitutionally absorb Fata. But Fata came as such without any reforms in terms of election or in terms of uh, party. This is only very recently, after 50 years, first, that, uh, or rather earlier in 1890 onwards, that election and then recently party and the vote and other paraphernalia of the electoral system of Pakistan were introduced and operationalized in FATA. Now in FATA, uh, there are a few issues which have been discussed in the last 10 years or so after 9-11. One is obviously that uh, it should be merged with AP. This is what ANP, Awami National Party, has been asking for, not all around, not very uh, enthusiastically, but somehow they, they after some for example, once uh, he was against it and recently he is for it, whatever. Fata merger with KP uh, and 
and PKMAT um, proposed uh, in the document which was prepared by the people uh, who finally gave us the 18th Amendment. The party united that there should be three provinces. Papunhua Northern, Papunhua Central, and Papunhua Southern. And the Patan areas of uh, Baluchistan should be Papunhua Southern. The three provinces he demanded uh, to absorb these areas into the mainstream or not uh, remains an open question. Uh, FATA has a nationalist base. FATA people do not want. Uh, majority of them do not want uh, the loss of their identity and independent position. But some do. They have started doing uh, simply uh, talking to others. Is there an independent political thinking on that count in Islamabad? For example, there can be, that's the possibility, that Punjab will not like the three Pakun areas of KP, Fata and Northern Baluchistan to become one, to be integrated and thereby pose a considerable challenge to the domination of Punjab. Is there this kind of thinking? Uh, I'm not sure. What I see is that Punjab as a stakeholder would probably like the status quo rather than uh, have next door a very strong Pathan uh, province. Uh, so there are various uh, aspects unrelated to each other, but it concludes with the Thank you. My name is Matthew Rajan, working with Work News Television. <coughs> Except when the 18th constitutional amendment was passed, we were told that with more autonomy given to provinces, it would be difficult for the military to intervene and take over in the future. And by devolution of power, we are actually strengthening the democratic process and the democratic system. Do you actually think that this is happening? And secondly, uh, the army has a huge economic interest now in the country, which is uh, unregulated, which is uh, not uh, overseen by the government and the parliament. So do you think these economic interests of uh, the military are in any way an obstacle to the devolution process? Thank you. Well, I would say that we the evolution is not light, is not the favorite option of this statute. There is no... Uh, they showed their resolution during the process, afterwards, and finally the military's thinking was reflected through the half measures taken in the direction of the implementation of the 18th Amendment, certainly. But then, what is happening in Dostan, for example, as I mentioned to our, and the economic loot is being talked about right now, so there are some who are being corrected <coughs> through whatever route. So there is not only the economic interest, as you know, the security interests of army also coming. So that interest, security interest, is not allowing the military establishment to put in place a kind of an autonomous government in Baluchistan that will listen. Autonomy, the very provincial autonomy, is despised or described or looked down upon is not very much accepted by the establishment. And as I said, for example, bureaucracy is reported on the all Pakistan basis. It is not on the provincial basis. 
This is a kind of a retrogressive march from IS, uh, Indian Civil Service, ICS. ICS, the steel frame of British India, for 100 years, probably more, it was recruited on the basis of provincial card. Provincial card. Actually, it changed to place in 1948 under Jordi He was the one who centralized the services. In other words, the understanding between the two institutions, the security apparatus of Pakistan, is in a way untouchable, till today, unfortunately, uh, and uh, it is a powerhouse in the state. And therefore, that enthusiasm which was there about the 18th Amendment in 2010 and 11 has been waning. And we are used to some kind of a failure of the implementation uh, of the amendment uh, to some extent, because there is partial devolution definitely, uh, but there are ways and means of adjusting with the new mechanism. Both are in a way in the process of adjusting the provinces and the centre. But there is nothing of a great challenge to the establishment at the moment, because they control the finance, and army doesn't feel easy then that they'll have to go to the provinces to get the defence budget. This is something which they find ridiculous because they feel that that will be kind of a dilution of their power. So they, can, they want to continue to be over and above the provincial sort of uh, financial base and only deal with the centre. So they will definitely don't want the centre to be weakened any further. The military business part of it. Sorry, say the thing. The military business part of my business. Business, yeah, of course, Aisha Siddiqui and others have written about it. Uh, the, the, the business part of uh, military enterprise is quite a bit. You know, sometimes it's said that military is the uh, biggest business enterprise in Pakistan, which it is. Uh, that's one. And second, of course, uh, when I talk down to the end of the videos, uh, by way of my research, uh, they say in 1950s and 60s the Americans subsidized the army. They made us, they developed the whole uh, apparatus of the army. Now to go where? So what we are doing is, and this is the bigger talking, that we have um, annual uh, um, show in Karachi for, uh, for, for defense sales with the third world countries particularly come and buy. Uh, and so the idea is that we try to earn the money because the nation will not be able to uh, subsidize us anymore. Uh, even though the largest chunk of uh, the budget goes uh, to them. So meaning thereby that economically speaking, they feel genuinely in their own way that uh, um, uh, prosperity is in their favor. They want to bring in money from abroad because it will help the institution, <coughs> for example, purchase of uh, arms and development of the uh, infrastructure for building arms and whatever. They have to have uh, an economic base, a viable economic base, and decentralization of finance is not ideal solution for that. Yeah. <coughs> My name is Alina Salama. I just wanted to uh, raise one point, was that when you talk, uh, compared Pakistan and India as constitution making, that in India the provinces were made set up on linguistic basis, but in Pakistan religion took the place of linguistic. I don't know how you can talk about religion in the same sense of a constitution issue. Uh, um, the idea is, sorry. Yes. Secondly, I'd like to know what you think of ATC being devo devolved to the provinces. Do you think it will work out? In I want to go back safely. Yes. Uh, 
Can't you see? Yes. Have you asked the general school for what you think about it? He has been well starting for the last couple of years. I said the last book has been critiqued. At least one critic, that is Hazana Sheikh, has blasted it. I want to hear. Yeah. Who? Yes. Maybe. I hope it's not a professional rivalry or whatever. But the book is considered to be a summation, a summary of her earlier work. So the lady that is Hazana Sheikh has denied originality to the book and he thinks that uh, Aisha Jalal should not have gone back to her previous books, corrected all the kind of data which she had put there and tried to bring up a new book, why did she do that and whatever. But I may not agree with that, uh, but I've just flipped through the book but not actually and comprehensively uh, gone through it. So that's one point and the second is of course that as you see the debate goes on uh, it's very difficult actually. Uh, those who were the critics of HEC, Good Boy and others, uh, somehow are in favor of continuing with the centralist control of HEC. So the, the, some others find it contradictory. Uh, um, but there are various opinions about it. Uh, HEC as a guardian of the principle of quality is open to question, thank you. I question it sometimes. Uh, there is a <coughs> lot done in terms of providing us access to the literature in the world through the new modern internet, library, system, train, whatever. That was 2001 uh, to HEC. Did HEC did in 13 or 14 years contribute to the qualitative research in Pakistan? The protagonists would say yes, others would say no. And, uh, there were genuine incentives given by your money. On the other hand, people feel that there has been a lot of corruption caused by that particular financial side of the initiative. Uh, I have been an examiner of some PhD theses. There are horrible theses. So that's also part of the reality. I'm sorry. There are various aspects. Uh, horrible. Uh, there was no chance of them passing. Uh, after eight years, for example, of hard work, so it's very inhuman in some ways, uh, but on the other hand, there's no quality. Some of them who were sent abroad to non-Anglo-American countries because of fee structure in Germany, in France, and others, some of them have done their doctorate and they've come back. So I haven't had much interaction with them, but I hope they are, they are, that's an improved in the situation. So that is how it is. Uh, uh, there are some, uh, but let's say there are those who are the, the leading personnel in the, in, the, in the institution are not the ones who are uh, internationally known scholars. I'm sorry to say that, but that, that, that. And so, so uh, you, you, the, the, the lady cannot be led by, uh, they cannot lead the, those who, who are uh, much better worse in, in, in terms of scholarship. So the problem remains where it was. Who will make policy? The ultimate producer of knowledge is university. If policy making continues to be outside the university campus, 
then there will always be a lag between the university, the productivity of knowledge on the one hand, and the policy makers, and those who hardly have uh, been known as recognized scholars on the other. So, so the class dynamics that's in the university, the bureaucratic policy making somewhere else, there needs to be some kind of integration between the two. And uh, I don't know what was the first point, but <laughs> maybe. I just asked about uh, religion being equated. To yeah, I don't equate actually, but I see uh, that in India they provided space for language and took away the space for religion. That doesn't mean that there is no religion. In, in India, Indians are as religious as we are. They are very religious people. Uh, so they, it's not secular, and it's not a secular country, and it's not a secular constitution either. What they say and they claim is that we define secularism in a way which is different from the way the West defines it. It's not secularization of morals and manners, attitude, um, dilution of faith or elimination of faith uh, from the private and public life. What we define here is that secularism means tolerance among faiths. This is the peculiar Nehruvian, uh, Congressite, Gandhian definition of secularism with continues. This is the way uh, Indian constitution uh, has rendered Indian polity as secular. Those, like, for example, Modi, who is uh, an evolved uh, Hindu uh, nationalist, uh, can easily say, and has said, day before yesterday, uh, that minorities uh, have to be taken care of, and we want a secular polity, etc. So, there's a kind of a contradiction, formality on the one hand, constitution on the one hand, symbol on the one hand, and the reality and the practice on the other. In Pakistan, uh, the very source, the very uh, emergence of the country as a separate country was on the basis of religion. Therefore, we have continued to look for uh, legitimacy in religion. And that has led to what we are there today. Unfortunately, from 1980s onwards particularly, but even before that, uh, Jena was straight away a deconflationist. He did not believe in conflation between religion and politics. But uh, in the last 60 years, we have moved to the other position where conflation between religion and politics is the norm. So there is a pendulum uh, moving, swing of the pendulum. The independence generation, for example, led by Jinnah, uh, he was a person who belonged to a minority sect anyway, Shia, uh, and before that he was, uh, or his father was Ismaili. So infidel of today, Shia, uh, and sometimes the infidel of the infidel, Kafir Kafir, which means Ismaili. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, he was the father of the nation. He is the father of the nation. On the one hand, on the 11th March, when they met, uh, apart from his speech, uh, who was the first president of the National Assembly at that time, the Constitutional Assembly of Pakistan? Anybody? Jugendar. Jugendar. Jena nominated. Jugendar, Nath, Mandel, Kulema and others suddenly were puzzled. You got Pakistan in the name of Islam. What are you talking about? Jugendar, he said, yes, Jugendar, Nath, Mandel. And after that, when he, there, there, there was the, the government emerging, who was in this country where Sharia was promised by political partners and workers? Who was the law minister? You can then not. <coughs> what was the vision after all? So there is a lot to be discussed and researched. So I don't know. Probably uh, Jena's daughter him, herself was not Muslim and he married a non Muslim. So whatever. So what I'm saying is that his uh, life pattern is such that there is a, uh, there's a space for um, politics um, other than the ideological expression which came out in the form of Pakistan. So this, this debate will continue probably. Uh, on the one hand there is Islamization, on the other hand there is a Westernization uh, going on. Uh, what will be the result? 
are we thinking as a nation or are we progressing? It's very clear to all of us. Uh, last question, sir. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Shafuddin and I write a democracy blog. Um, I would like to invite your comments on two apparent contradictions in the 18th Amendment. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the 18th Amendment uh, strengthens Article 6 and does away with uh, 58 b but at the same time, in the disqualification clause for the members of the National Assembly, it admits uh, that any person who ridicules the armed forces will be disqualified from the elections. Uh, the second... I, I talk about Article uh, 63G, about the disqualifications. Uh, on the, other, uh, the second contradiction I would like to point out is that uh, here are the leaders of the political parties and elected representatives who are um, reiterating the supremacy of the parliament rep representative government but at the time of elections in Article 224 1A, I think, um, they are also admitting that they don't trust each other and they, knew they need a data prime minister uh, to have the elections carried out. Uh, and uh, I would also like to point out that the country which introduced the caretaker formula in the region has done away with it. Which introduced? Uh, the caretaker formula for elections, which is Bangladesh, has done away with this clause now. Yeah. So, yeah. first we talk about the contradiction. Uh, our constitution is full of contradictions. So, this is the fact of life that we live in. It says there should be no distinction or rather segregation against this, 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 and this. No uh, caste, caste, creed, and, and caste, and then we practice caste, distinction and practice. The role of women is the way it is. So this definitely uh, anti constitutional practice of politics. Uh, the state is supposed to, as one of the principles of policy, enable people to live their lives according to the religion Islam. This is the enabling clause clause so on. This enabling clause you go to the people and whatever they are doing, you put independent of that particular constitutional um, input. So similarly, there are two things. One, Article 62, 63, politicians will avoid to touch it because it uses the word, for example, I mean, is a, it carries morality. The word was used for profit. As if the moment you think about revising the phrase, amending, you will be considered un-Islamic. So politicians, for the fear of it, for the fear of being branded un-Islamic, would not touch it. Once it has been incorporated uh, in the constitution by Ziaulhaq. Ziaulhaq also lowered the status of parliament and used the word advisory council, shura, majlisi shura, mm -hmm. instead of a sovereign parliament, which it is or should be. No government and no politician and no political party has demanded rolling back that particular word for parliament advised the council, which is Majlis Ashura. Why? Because in early Islam, that word was used. So it is considered to be Islamic for some reason. Uh, it is like for the last 20 years or so, uh, gradually the whole family planning program has gone down and these days, apart from the population explosion which is there, uh, the very talk about um, population explosion or population control that is not heard because of the fear of Islamization or Islamic lobby which is out there. So these are the things which are called political realities whereas the constitution does provide um, 
various provisions which, which are so-called contradictory to it. For example, Article 25, universal education is now compulsory as per the 18th Amendment. So, so yes, the 18th Amendment, like other amendments, are um, uh, there is a kind of uh, a letter of intent. This should be there below the weakest province and the Baloch leadership, the weakest leadership in Pakistan did not expect probably that these new insertions in the constitution will really fertilize the district. Mm -hmm. But this is one step forward. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, last one. Okay. My name is Alauddin Shahri, former Constant General of Pakistan in Manchester and also former television producer. My comment is, first of all, then I raise the question, despite, despite the reservation, very serious reservation, and despite the opposition of the bureaucracy and the provincial governments for a long time, you know, the local body the elections are going to be held also in Pakistan, starting from KPK, Balochistan, and probably in Sindh, and also the Punjab. Now, with my experience in Britain, I believe there has been a lot of uh, efforts on the part of the British government to inspire the Pakistan government and the establishments to go for the local bodies, you know, uh, as part of the devolution of power. And of course, as you said earlier, there is the political initiatives and the role played by the military in that contest as well. So my question here will be, what would you see in the future, the local bodies coming into being as a full force, and in the future, whether or not the political parties will also start playing a role to have influence in the process. Thank you. My answer is that political parties mm, will not have to swallow this bitter pill and hold elections. The second answer is that they will, they, that is the politicians will continue to deny power to the district governments. It will not be like under Musharraf because they want power in the provincial secretariat, not in the district. Therefore, uh, they that will be the first step if elections are held on the party basis and if the local body starts functioning. That will only be the first step. <laughs> Whether it will move on to powerful local government institution, I should doubt. Because provincial politicians struggling with the center and center being dominated by the bureaucrats and on top of that, army, I don't think that devolution from the province downwards is the future. It's very unfortunate. Uh, we are speaking loudly, uh, expressing one's fears. I am totally for devolution, obviously. But what I'm saying is that these insecure politicians who are engaged in their own struggle for bringing down from the center, finance and freedom from control, from the center control bureaucracy. They are, they are, they are, the struggle is somewhere else, not at the level of district. Therefore, all the noble ambitions put aside, nothing is going to happen that way. I remember, I was in fact part of a project. A DFID, Department for International Development, <coughs> gave quite a bit of serious attention to it, uh, finance and whatever goes with it. Uh, so when the report we prepared, for example, uh, Berkey, uh, Shah Javed Berkey met uh, President Sheriff at that time and there was some uh, discussion about that. Uh, in the end, the moment there is democracy back in operation, local government goes out of the door. This simply is the situation. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you.